When I think of Mary, the mother of Jesus, I think of the forgotten city of Sepphoris. According to tradition, Mary was the firstborn daughter of an older couple named Joachim and Anna who lived there. Few today have heard of Sepphoris. It is not mentioned in the New Testament. Until fairly recently, it was not even included on those maps of the Holy Land found in the back of many Bibles. I first took my students to excavate at Sepphoris in the summer of 1996. After more than two decades of excavations by several teams of archaeologists, not even one-tenth of the ancient Roman city has been exposed. Yet enough has been done to begin to offer us a glimpse of the splendor of the place in the time of Mary and her son Jesus. When Jesus was growing up in Nazareth, Sepphoris was the dominant city of the entire region. Built on a hill rising 400 feet above the plain below, it is still visible from miles around. Jesus' well-known saying that a city set on a hill cannot be hid surely came to him growing up in Nazareth and looking north at the gleaming city of Sepphoris just four miles away. It could not be missed. Nazareth was hardly anything. Nestled in the hills just to the southeast by a spring, the total population was probably not more than 200. It was one of dozens of small villages that dotted the plain around the huge and impressive capital city of Sepphoris. Today things are reversed. Nazareth is the largest Arab city in Israel with a population of over 60,000, half Christian, half Muslim. It literally fills the hills and valleys around its center with impressive suburbs and magnificent churches. Sepphoris is a bare hill dotted with ancient ruins in the distance. Every day at our excavations, we would sit on the southern slopes of the ruins of Sepphoris and eat our lunch, gazing across the valley at the bustling city of Nazareth, gleaming in the late morning sun. We tried to imagine how different things must have been. When Mary was born around the year 18 BC, the Romans occupied the northern area of Palestine called Galilee. Sepphoris was a Jewish city, but the Romans had made it the administrative center for the entire region. Herod the Great ruled the country. He had been an intimate friend of Antony and Cleopatra. The Roman general Octavian, later to reign as Caesar Augustus, confirmed him as king of the Jews. And yet Herod lacked the vital royal bloodline of King David that would have entitled him to such a throne. Herod had a Jewish mother but an Idumean father. He was sensitive about his half-Jewish origins, which many Jews considered a disqualification for legitimate rule over Israel. Out of jealousy and fear, he ordered the public genealogical records of the leading Israelite families destroyed. He also married Mariamne, a princess of the priestly Hashmoneans, in a vain effort to placate Jewish opposition to his base origins. The Hashmonean line produced the Maccabees, who had ruled the country for a century before the Romans invaded Palestine. Josephus, the first century Jewish historian, tells us that Herod went so far as to equip the desert fortress Masada as a place to flee should the population depose him and restore a ruler of David's royal line. In those times, power was one thing, but pedigree particularly that of the native royal family, was quite another. And this matter of pedigree takes us right back to Nazareth. In 4 BC, when Mary would have been about 14, Herod the Great died. Shortly after his death, a certain Judas, son of Ezekias, broke into the royal palace at Sepphoris. After seizing all the arms that were stored there, he and his followers began to rampage throughout Galilee. Pockets of revolt and opposition to Rome broke out all over the country. The Romans reacted quickly and with overwhelming force. The Roman governor of Syria, the infamous Publius Quintilius Varus, led three legions from Syria to brutally crush opposition to Roman rule. As many as 20,000 troops poured in, burnt Sepphoris to the ground, 
and sent its inhabitants into slavery as punishment for their participation in the outbreaks. Varus rounded up rebels all over the country and crucified 2,000 men who'd participated in the revolt. The trauma that gripped Galilee must have been dreadful, with dying men nailed to crosses at intervals up and down the main roads or on hillsides. After the revolt, the Romans divided Palestine into three districts, each ruled by a son of Herod the Great. Archelaus received Judea, which was in the south, and included the mountainous territory to the north called Samaria. Philip was given charge of the region east of the Jordan, around the Sea of Galilee. Herod Antipas received the territory of Galilee, north of Judea, as well as Perea, east of the Jordan River. This was the same Herod who later beheaded John the Baptist and participated in the trial of Jesus. Herod Antipas chose to fortify and rebuild the city of Sepphoris, making it his palatial capital. It had a 4,000-seat theater, colonnaded streets and markets, civic buildings, an elaborate water system, and public baths. Josephus, who was eyewitness to its splendor, writes that Sepphoris became the ornament of all Galilee. But as Herod Antipas consolidated his hold over his bequeathed territories, his legitimacy to the throne was suspect. Who was the rightful king of Israel? Sometime before the conflagration of Sepphoris, Mary and her family moved to the little village of Nazareth, just four miles southeast. We have no record of what happened to her parents, Joachim and Anna, but we do know what became of their daughter. At the time of the revolt and brutal suppression, Mary, aged 14 or 15, was already considered a woman and was pledged in marriage to a local artisan named Joseph. It was at this time that she had her own troubles. She got pregnant before the marriage, and Joseph was not the father. Luke says that when the couple went to Bethlehem for the birth of Jesus, Mary was still his betrothed. The Greek word he uses is very clear. It means they were still only engaged, yet she was ready to deliver the child. After the birth of her child in Bethlehem, the couple returned to Nazareth right in the aftermath of the Jewish revolt, with the smoke of Sepphoris scarcely cleared. With an understanding of the history of Sepphoris, a whole new set of images is added to the Christmas story, crucified corpses rotting on crosses, the nearby capital city in flames, and fellow citizens either killed or exiled into slavery. The future of this family was hardly certain. As we begin to reconstruct the birth, life, and teachings of Jesus, our best and earliest sources are the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, contained in the New Testament. For the past 200 years, scholars have analyzed and compared these texts and their relationship to one another. This painstaking research has allowed us to read them more carefully and to use them responsibly as we do other ancient historical sources even though they're included in the New Testament as sacred texts. All four New Testament Gospels are written in Greek, though we have an ancient tradition that the Gospel of Matthew was originally composed in Hebrew or Aramaic. The names associated with these Gospels are traditional, and the authors, whoever they might have been, never identify themselves by name. Mark is our earliest Gospel, even though it comes second in the New Testament. Mark was written around 70 A.D., and it provides us with the basic narrative framework of the career of Jesus. Matthew was written next, likely around 80 A.D., and the author uses Mark as his main source but edits it freely. The author of Matthew also had access to a collection of the teachings of Jesus that we call Q, which Mark did not have. He incorporates that material into his work as well. Luke was written around 90 A.D., and the author uses both Mark and the Q source, but he has a considerable amount of his own material with which he supplements his story. These three Gospels, Mark, Matthew, and Luke, are called the synoptics because of the tight literary relationship between them. One simple way of putting this is that Mark provides the basic storyline, and both Matthew and Luke use Mark 
but incorporate Q in some of their own materials. John is our latest gospel, written toward the close of the first century, and it has no literary connection to the three synoptic gospels. The author of John offers us an entirely independent tradition focusing on Jesus as a divine and exalted Son of God. In that sense, John is more theologically oriented, but that is not to say his account is devoid of valuable historical information. Without John's independent record, we would lack many important geographical and chronological details. There are other Gospels than these four. The Gospel of Thomas was written in Coptic and was discovered in 1945 in Egypt. A Hebrew version of Matthew was passed down within rabbinic circles, and a half dozen so called apocryphal Gospels were composed in the 2nd and 3rd centuries AD. But our most reliable sources for reconstructing what we can know about Jesus are the New Testament Gospels themselves. When they are read carefully and critically, many new and fascinating insights emerge. We begin our investigation with what we can know about Mary's pregnancy and the birth of her firstborn son, Jesus. We can imagine the stir Mary's pregnancy must have caused in a village the size of Nazareth. Both families were well known. Houses were often close together, with married children often living in extensions of the main house, sharing a common courtyard. There were not many secrets in Nazareth. Joseph had a serious problem that no fiancé wants even to imagine. He was engaged to Mary, their families had agreed to a marriage, but his bride-to-be was found to be with child before the wedding. Joseph was the one who discovered the pregnancy, and according to the Gospel of Matthew, he resolved to break off plans for the marriage while keeping things quiet so as not to shame her. With or without his help, Mary left town hastily and, according to tradition, went south to the little village of Ein Kerem, four miles west of Jerusalem in the hill country of Judea. There Mary stayed for three months with close family relatives an older couple, Elizabeth and Zechariah. Elizabeth was pregnant herself at the time, in her sixth month, with the child we know as John the Baptist, or, more literally, John the Baptizer. How Mary and Elizabeth were related, we don't know, whether cousins or perhaps niece and aunt, but given these circumstances, the two families were likely very close. And this means that Jesus and John the Baptizer were related as well. According to Luke, the birth took place in Bethlehem in response to a Roman tax census. Bethlehem, just outside of Jerusalem in Judea, is in the south of the country, while Nazareth is in the north in Galilee, about a three-day journey apart. Luke tells us that the couple, finding the city overcrowded and all guest rooms booked, lodged in a stable where Jesus was born. It is common to find cave-like structures from that time hollowed out of the rock and attached to dwellings used to shelter domestic animals. Since Joseph and his betrothed Mary were not yet married, we don't know when the wedding took place, but it had to be after the birth of the child. Luke later refers to Jesus as a son of Joseph, yet he clearly does not believe that Joseph is the father. He implies by this language that the couple married and that Joseph became the legal adoptive father of Jesus. Matthew says that Joseph took his wife, but he does not say when. He adds a fascinating note, that the couple only had sexual relations after the birth of the child. This would fit with Luke's implication that the marriage took place after the birth, In Jewish culture, the sexual act of knowing the woman is what consummated the marriage. That's the bare outline presented in the first chapters of the Gospels of Matthew and Luke. The other two Gospels, Mark and John, begin their accounts with Jesus as an adult and tell us nothing at all about his birth. Matthew and Luke both agree on the source of Mary's pregnancy. In Matthew's account, Joseph had a dream shortly after finding out about the pregnancy. In this dream, an angel told him that her pregnancy was by a Holy Spirit 
and that he was to go ahead with the marriage regardless. He was to name her child Jesus by marrying a pregnant woman who carried a child that was not his. In legally naming that child, he was in effect adopting Jesus as his legal son. The phrase by a Holy Spirit implies that the pregnancy came from the agency of God's Spirit, but falls short of saying outright that God was the father of Jesus in the sense that, say, Zeus was said to be the father of Hercules by his seduction of his mother Alcmene. In that sense, the account is different from those miraculous birth stories. So common in Greco Roman mythology. Matthew also alludes to an ancient saying of the Hebrew prophet Isaiah A young woman shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel, as if to say that Mary's pregnancy was a fulfillment of prophecy. But Isaiah was speaking of a child to be born in his own day, the 8th century BC. Matthew implies that Isaiah's prophecy was fulfilled by the miraculous birth of Jesus. But the original text clearly carries no such meaning. In Luke's account, it is Mary who had a dream. The angel Gabriel told her that she would become pregnant, bear a son, and name him Jesus. The name Jesus in Hebrew is the same as the name Joshua and was quite common among Jews at the time. This child would be called the Son of the Most High and sit on the throne of his father David, ruling over the nation of Israel forever. Mary responded, How will this be since I don't know a man? This biblical expression definitely means to have sex. The angel replied, A holy spirit will come upon you, and power of the Most High will overshadow you, so the holy thing begotten will be called the Son of God. The earliest Christian creeds affirm, based on these texts, that Jesus was conceived of the Holy Spirit. Born of the Virgin Mary. It is easy to confuse the Immaculate Conception with the Virgin Birth. The Immaculate Conception, as taught by the Roman Catholic Church, refers to the conception of Mary by her mother Anna, not to the conception of Jesus. This teaching holds that Mary was born without original sin, inherited by every human being since Adam. This allowed her to give birth to Jesus in a special state of moral purity. The virgin birth is a further teaching that Mary, without a man, became pregnant through the agency of the Holy Spirit. It refers more to the source of the pregnancy than to the birth itself. A further Catholic dogma holds that Mary remained a perpetual virgin her entire life. Even Protestant leaders such as Luther, Calvin, Zwingli, and John Wesley shared this view, though it is less common among Protestants today. Mary was idealized over time as the divine like, holy Mother of God. She was so far removed from her culture and her time that the very idea that she had sexual relations, bore additional children, and lived a normal life as a married Jewish woman seemed unthinkable for centuries. She was quite literally exalted to heaven, and her actual humanity was lost, as was the importance of her forefathers.